episode number 284, The State of the Church, Barna Research Review with Savannah Kimberlin, part one. Let's do it. This is the definitive podcast for helping you plan, create, and execute dynamic worship experiences at your church. Useful, practical content in the areas of production, worship, communications, first impressions, and more. This is Making Sunday Happen. Hey guys, this is Making Sunday Happen, the podcast for those who plan, create, and execute physical and digital worship experiences all around the world. Glad to have you here. This week, I'm going to share my interview with Savannah Kimberlin from Barna. She is Barna's Director of Published Research. We'll be walking through some of the top findings from Barna, showing real stats on church online, church attendance, the state of where we are as a church, and more. This week and next week with Savannah, you're going to get a real sense of the state of the church and where we are and where we can go uh, as a church. So real, real stats. You know, a lot of times we can guess and say the church is experiencing this right now, or I think the church should go in this direction, or this is what I'm seeing. Barna has done a lot of research over the last year. I mean, they're they're known for research uh, anyway, but over the last year, specifically the last six to eight months, they've done a ton of research on the state of the church, on uh, are people watching our services online, are people attending, or the, is church declining? What about millennials? What about Gen X? Uh, how are families treating Sunday? Are they skipping out on church? Are we church hopping? All of that kind of stuff. We are going to tackle that this week and next week. So I know a lot of times we can uh, we can guess, but this week and next week you're going to get some real hard stats on the state of the church. And I am so excited to share this information with you. It is really, really good stuff. I'm really pumped about today's show. All right, first, let's check the mailbag. Last week in the mailbag, I shared several photos of churches, your churches, in action, and I want to do the same thing this week and over the next few weeks. So if you guys have photos, feel free to send them in. I would love to uh, feature your church on the podcast. Uh, You can email me directly, carl at 1230.media, or find me on social. Uh, These are photos of church media, worship, and guest services teams doing ministry Uh, each and every week. They're making Sunday happen. So if you're listening to this podcast, feel free to jump on and watch episodes of our show. Watch this episode at makingsundayhappen.com to check out uh, these pictures. Here is the parking lot team at Benson Pentecostal Holiness Church in Benson, North Carolina. Your first impressions team is part of the experience. First impressions in general is part of the experience that you're trying to create at your church, of people coming uh, to your church and coming back. People decide very quickly whether whether they are going to come back to your church. Uh, Even before, sometimes that decision happens even before they step into your auditorium. So this is a great picture of a parking lot team uh, from Benson Pentecostal Holiness, uh, and and their parking team is so important. Your parking team is so important, very important to what you do. So thank you guys there in Benson, North Carolina. Uh, great work. Uh, also, here are some photos from Josiah Gopp at Cornerstone Bible Church in Britain, South Dakota. Uh, he says uh, these are these are running video and sound. Josiah said thank you. Uh, to Jesus for committed volunteers to run ProPresenter. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, And uh, that is so true uh, because uh, it takes everybody to make Sunday happen, ProPresenter operators included. You know, I used to tell uh, ProPresenter operators that they're worship leaders because they are. They're just as important as the, uh, the guy or the gal with the guitar or instrument on stage. You are providing lyrics for people to worship our Savior. You are a worship leader. So way to go, uh, guys, there at Cornerstone Bible Church. Uh, Here is a photo of the same church, 
It's their first day back in a modified potluck. Uh, so they're, they're having a good time fellowshipping together. This was in October of last year. Uh, again, if you have a photo or question for the mailbag, feel free to send it in. Uh, we would love to answer your question or show showcase the work that God is doing at your church. You can email me, carl at 1230.media, or find me on social media. My handle everywhere is at Carl Barnhill. All right, this is a big show for us. I'm so glad that you're with us. I cannot wait to share my interview with Savannah Kimberlin from Barna, and it starts right after this. Hey guys, does your church feel stuck right now? Are your messages and your ministries just not connecting with people like they used to? Well, it doesn't have to be that way. My friends at Firm Foundations Marketing are passionate about the Great Commission and using their gifts to help empower your church to communicate in a way that connects. Firm Foundations Marketing helps church leaders like you understand what's going on in your community so that you can speak to them in more meaningful ways and ultimately reach, engage, and retain more people. Don't be discouraged because everyone's digital, disconnected, and dispersed. Take the first step towards growth today. Firm Foundations has a free download to help you get started. To get your copy, head to firmfoundationsmarketing.com. That's firmfoundationsmarketing.com. Hey guys, today I welcome Savannah Kimberlin from Barna. She is Barna's Director of Published Research. She oversees the research and development of a wide array of published products and client commissioned work, including Barna monographs and digital resources. Savannah, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Carl. I am really, really excited about our conversation today. Uh, Before we jump in, I I said your title, but tell us a little bit about what you do at Barna. Sure. So I'm on the research team here at Barna, uh, which means that I get to work day in and day out to help solve problems for the local church and for the organizations that serve the local church. It's really, really cool. I have the best job in the world. And um, I also spend a lot of time talking to different church leaders and help with, with some consulting services as well. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, as I was researching today for our conversation, there are a thousand different ways that we can uh, go. And uh, because you guys have done a mountain of research on the state of the church, especially Mm -hmm. in the last year. And uh, I'm really excited to to go through it. So uh, let's start with this. So uh, you guys at the beginning of 2020, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but at the beginning of last year, you guys set out to analyze or, or have, uh, you know, been analyzing stuff for decades, and you kind of mm-hmm. set out to do this state of the church type project, and then COVID nineteen just really took uh, that into a dramatic turn. Uh, am I getting that right? And and tell me kind of where your focus shifted. Yes, actually, at the beginning of March, we had a big webcast. Um, it was literally three days before the nation shut down to announce this state of the church initiative. Um, so obviously after we put on this event and made the formal announcement that this is what we were going to do for 2020, everything changed. <laughs> yeah. So we had to pivot as well. And in that, essentially what we did is redefine, um, when we say the state of the church, what are we studying? Because church changed. And so what is it? What is the state of the church in 2020? So we pivoted our focus and instead of really digging into um, historic trends this year, we instead focused largely on what we call human flourishing. So how are the people in our congregations doing? And so we built a free assessment called the the People Pulse Assessment to measure the flourishing of people. And we really focused on um, just-in-time research. So we were we were gathering data weekly, uh, releasing that data weekly on our website, like really, really trying to keep our finger on the pulse of what is happening and shifting this year. Yeah, uh, obviously a huge shift. So you guys have, at the end of 2020, you guys put out a uh, an article uh, or a, a listing of articles of about 10, uh, seven or 10 things that you found across the year. Yep. Uh, and so I want to cover uh, a few of those in our time together uh, this week and next week. So uh, I want to hit on just some of the major findings. So the first one that you found 
Uh, and I've cited this one before, so it's it's great to hear this from from directly from you guys. So the first major finding is that one in three practicing Christians, and we should probably define that, mm-hmm. um, have stopped attending church completely. So kind of define our terms for us and then talk about that one for a second. Sure. So practicing Christians, that's um, a group of Christians that, that that's the term that Barnett uses. Um, essentially, they are the set of Christians that actively, consistently practice their faith. So they attend church at least monthly. Many of them attend weekly, but at least monthly. And they say that their religious faith is very important in their life. So these are our golden Christians, so to speak. So um, so to put it in perspective, 75% of Americans call themselves Christian, right? They use, they use the term, that's how they self-identify. However, only one in four, so 25% of Americans meet Barna's definition of practicing Christian. So we're talking about one, about one in four Americans today. Um, so the statistic that you shared is, is correct. That's a data point that we released in July that one in three practicing Christians has stopped attending church altogether. And really what this, this data point suggested, even in July, which was in the middle of 2020, which is wild to think about um, because the pandemic extended well into, you know, into the end of the year, of course. Um, It, what it suggests is a break in pattern for these practicing Christians, because before the pandemic, many of them were attending weekly. Um, And so when we did further research on attendance trends in the fall, like after we pulled out of the summer and emerged into the fall, we wanted to do more research. So we took another look at that trend and we saw that the numbers had shifted slightly um, so that one in four practicing Christians had said that they, they still had not attended a service or had really experienced a disruption in their faith practice and like had maybe attended once. Um, but so that's a bit of an improvement, but still one in four say that they have not attended. Um, and really it just shows that this year has caused a major break in pattern for so many people who were faithfully practicing their faith before the pandemic. So we might get into this more, but I want to, I want to ask this here. So did you find that, uh, when the pandemic hit, did you find a massive surge in online streaming? And has that gone down and leveled out where people are coming back in person and streaming? Or are you finding that they've completely walked away? What are your findings across the year on that regard? Yeah, that's a great question. So I can tie in what I just shared about, okay, a lot of people have stopped attending, but a lot of churches did report that they saw a spike in numbers in their online views. And they found that to be really, really exciting and and hopeful for sure. And then in many cases, churches are reporting that numbers are leveling out. So I understand why, why you're asking this question. Um, I will say that we found in our research that for many, many Christians and non-Christians alike, but primarily Christians is what we'll talk about today. Um, Watching an online service versus participating in or attending a service are two different things. So when we ask someone, have you watched an online service? They may say yes. And then have you attended an online service? They're going to say no. So when we saw that spike Mm. at the beginning of the pandemic, well, firstly, a lot of smaller churches, it took them a while to pivot to digital. So there weren't as many digital service options for those first couple of weeks. So that's why the churches that were offering digital services likely saw that spike because many local churches had not pivoted. But then secondly, this point that I've just made of watching versus attending are two different things in the minds of many people who are consuming church services online. What should that tell us and I might ask you this again later, but what should that tell us in the way of how we craft our worship experiences for Sunday? How do we go, how do we balance the fact that someone's watching versus attending? Do we, is it less music? Is it shorter? Is it, what? what's the differences there? Absolutely. Right. So I think that's a very healthy question for all church leaders to ask. Um, we know that attention spans are shorter 
we probably will we'll talk about that a bit later as well. Like, what does it look like for um, for people to have split focus or kids running around in their living room or as, as they're multitasking? Um, so should sermons be shorter? And then what does it look like to promote active participation in a service? Um, we we have seen churches that never did call and response or liturgical prayer um, or guided prayer by the pastor. They normally don't do that on Sundays, start incorporating that into their Sunday services and it being successful because you're, you're encouraging participation. Um, another thing to think about is volunteer engagement. So a lot of Christians before the pandemic were actively engaged with volunteering, and that was how they felt like they belonged to their church community. That's how they remained connected to their church community. So right. are you perhaps incorporating volunteers in your services? Um, we, we definitely need to think outside of the box when we're talking about engagement. Um, if I mean, frankly, if a leader is just putting up an iPhone and preaching the exact same sermon to his iPhone that he was before the pandemic, same length, same style, same everything, um, you're probably going to have congregants that are struggling to remain engaged. Mm, Good. So does that tell us, I shouldn't just put up a camera in the back of the room and let it go. I have to be intentional about engaging so that the audience member is attending, not just watching. Would I be accurate in that? Yep. That's great. Does that support your research? Great summary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, are people still attending the church that they were attending before COVID? Yep. So, um, yes, we got this question a lot because we we got asked a lot in the first couple of months. Are people church hopping? What's going on? Am I losing all my congregants? Mm-hmm. They were very concerned. Um, but we found in our research that we conducted in September, so a ways into the pandemic, that 90% of church adults that were still attending church were remaining committed to the church that they were committed to before the pandemic. So that's the vast majority, which is a good sign. There, there certainly is loyalty in play here. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, What's the age breakdown? Are millennials, uh, what'd you see as far as age differences in watching, attending, not going at all? Yeah. So, um, right. So millennial engagement is a hot topic of discussion. We've found that, speaking of the previous point I just made about loyalty, uh, younger generations are a little less likely to be loyal. So we're seeing more sampling um, for millennials and Gen Z. Um, the habit of, oh, I'm attending multiple churches, that's more common. So to put a number to it, about 30% of millennials say that they are testing other churches, um, which which is a notable proportion. But again, to bring us back to that that point that I made before of attending versus watching, perhaps they're just consuming more church content from, from different places. Right. Um, so They're watching my church and another church. Yes, for sure. We can't necessarily say that loyalty is off the table, um, but they certainly are sampling about 30% of millennials. And, and so we have seen overall, just with Christian millennials and their church engagement trends, we are seeing a decline. So millennials are less likely than the older generations to have attended at all during this pandemic. So those, those churched millennials and to be more precise. So to put numbers to that 55% of churched millennials, meaning that they, they were at least sort of engaged with the church before the pandemic, 55% of them have not attended at all versus 42% of Gen X and 43% of boomers. Hmm. So they hang in the fifties instead of the forties. Hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So let's move on to the second major finding and that is race or uh, racial issues. So mm-hmm. uh, obviously race, uh, racial injustice has been a, a major topic of, uh, of 2020 with different major events happening Uh, So what have you guys found surrounding race issues in the church last year? Yeah, we wanted to be very intentional um, and very thorough in our exploration of everything that happened this year pertaining to race, especially um, in regards to the worldview of Christians. And so we studied a couple of things and I'll give you some of those statistics. So 
Um, back in 2019, we, we ran some race research as well on racial injustice. And then so we wanted to update those numbers for 2020 after everything um, happened. And so one statement that we asked in 2019 and chose to ask again in 2020 was this. Um, do you think that our country has a race problem? And interestingly, that percentage did not move year to year. So Christians and the general population alike are just as likely to say, yes, we have a race problem. However, when we add it, add it into our questions um, a bit stronger language, then we started to see some divergence. So we asked, are you motivated to address race, racial injustice? And for practicing Christians this year, we actually saw a decline in motivation. So in 2019, for practicing Christians, 17% um, said that they were unmotivated to address racial injustice. And then in 2020, that number increased to 30%. So this year, now 30% of practicing Christians have said that they are unmotivated to address racial injustice. Okay, so here's my major question here. <clears throat> Do you think that 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 that's a that's a major uh bump uh mm -hmm. and so that is very interesting to explore so my question is do you think that that is because of the election year because it is so politically motivated that oh that that's politics that is uh you know they're driving a narrative there it's a politically driven thing and so that's why i'm not really motivated to to do that do you think that that will change in a non-election year how political mm -hmm. is this you know, that's hard to say, but I, I think election year or not, this topic is becoming a very polarizing topic. Mm -hmm. And so even for the Christians who perhaps were on the fence before about, okay, am I motivated or not motivated? I don't know. Um, perhaps they're now leaning more towards not being motivated because it's just so polarizing. Um, it's it's hard to get involved. Um, it, it's, it's just hard to know how to get involved. It's very polarizing. So, um, and another finding that perhaps answers your question is we asked respondents, do you believe that your efforts would actually have an impact? And we saw that a lot of Christians were not confident that their efforts would, would make an impact, that they would be able to really make a difference. So it's a polarizing issue. It's a really, really big issue. And so Christians are struggling to see how do I fit into this? What is my place in this, in this issue? So this podcast is called Making Sunday Happen. So we talk about the worship experience. That, that's the main thing that we're after. So on this topic, what would you suggest, if anything, that this issue relates to the worship experience? Here's what I mean. Uh, should pastors be preaching on this topic more? Should we be starting initiatives or trying to solve, you know, have some type of ministry that hits this issue? How does this translate to action, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. We at Barna strongly believe that pastors should be data-informed leaders. So my recommendation would be, pastor, what is your congregation looking for? Have you asked them, do they, do they want you to lead them in this? Are they looking for, um, looking for you to talk about this, to start Bible studies or small groups where you can have open and honest conversations where perhaps the different ethnicities that are present in within your congregation can come together and talk about this. Is that something that they're looking for? Um, you know, send out a survey monkey <laughs> to your volunteers. Um, <clears throat> we, we would definitely say be a data informed leader and then you can um, use that data to decide, is this something that I should be addressing or is this not something I should be addressing? Good. Okay. That's good, good information. All right. Let's address, let's move on to, to the next one. Let's address the issue that practicing Christians are now a smaller segment of the population. So talk to me about how Christians are reducing in number. Yep. So we did release um, some trend data at the beginning of 2020. Um, I believe this article was released in March, and I would encourage any listeners to go take a look at it. It's free on our website. It's called Signs of Decline and Hope. It's a great article. 
And um, as we unpack some historical trends, um, what we have found is that right around 2008, 2009, 2010, there was a shift in our nation. And we started to see a decline in Mm. all things Christian. (laughs) So in um, meeting the practicing Christian definition, so so being that that faithful type of believer, church attendance, um, the rest. So we definitely have seen um, a shift and it has been a downward trend ever since 2008, 2009. What what happened in 2008, 2009 that precipitated that? That's that's the question, Carl. Um, <laughs> there are certainly many things that happened. If, if we think back, um, 2008, 2009 is really when smartphones started to take over the market. Think about when Facebook started to become really popular. Wow. Um, there was an election that year. And we had economic difficulties as a nation that year. Um, other things that started to happen, millennials really became of age that year. The top end of millennials started having children, getting married, having families right around that time. Gen Z was, was in childhood and starting to enter the, t- the teen years, um, you know, the early teen years at, around that time. So our nation was largely shifting even just in its, um, in its identity. And with that shift in identity, we saw a shift in religious practice and affiliation. Wow. Wow. Uh, that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And you you guys found that atheist, agnostic, and the non uh, segment has mm-hmm. doubled since 2003, actually. So not just decline, but no God at all. Is mm-hmm. that what you're finding? Yep. Yep. And there are probably... There are many reasons why we're we're seeing that number increase. Um, the rise of the nuns, as some some are calling it, um, and and there are multiple factors in play here as well. We see that a lot of members of the millennial and Gen Z generations are affiliating as atheist or agnostic or or none of the above, no faith. Um, so that is certainly a common trend for younger generations, perhaps. These, these are the younger believers who are um, that were raised in households of boomers and Gen Xers who left the church because um, certainly a lot of a lot of them left religious practice. Um, you know, those older generations left religious practice. So their children are now atheist agnostic nuns. That's something that we're seeing. And also um, another interesting finding that we found in 2019 in a study that we conducted on millennials is that many of them hold the opinion that the church cannot answer their questions, does not answer their questions. It's just not helpful for me to be a Christian or to practice my faith. So even just simply put, the usefulness of church or faith, um, millennials and Gen Z are seeing that um, seeing that as being less, less worthwhile. What does that mean for how we do church? I mean, obviously, if we're seeing this major decline, are we doing something wrong? What what could we be doing differently? I don't know. I'll just pose it and let you let you run with that. Sure. I I think we need to be honest about the fact that the needs of this generation are different. The fact that they are willing to say in a survey to us, the church doesn't answer my questions means that they have questions that they're asking and they're not they're not getting the answers from people of faith to those questions. So we need to maybe stop and reflect and say okay, well are we do we know the questions they're asking? Are we trying to answer those questions? Have we changed our programming or our evangelism tactics or um our youth, our youth ministry curriculum, like have we have we innovated in those spaces with the needs of the next generation in mind? Um, you know, as we're working to make Sundays happen, have you thought about your preaching style? We know that that um, young adults today really like to engage um, in dialogue to learn. They like to learn um, through relationship and. So are you building relationship with the young adults in your congregation to earn their trust? Are you, are mm. you dialoguing with them to help them process things? All, all of these are different ways 
that leaders can innovate to, to reach the next generation. So to, to answer your question, Carl, have we done something wrong? I mean, yes and no. I, I think the, the trend is largely cultural in that, um, you know, society itself is shifting outside of the church and that is affecting this trend, this rise in the nuns. But we also, we can do better to, to innovate and uh, meet the next generation where they are. So based on the research, would it be accurate to say that church is not, the way we've done church in the past is not as effective now as it used to be? That is what the research suggests because the needs of the next generation are different. Um, I, th- I think to put it this way, if you were to tell a boomer, believe that Jesus is the son of God, it would be a lot more, it would be a lot easier historically for the boomer just to accept that and say, yes, someone who is in a spiritual position of authority has told me to believe this. And my Bible says that this is true. So therefore I believe this is true. Whereas that natural progression to belief is not the same for younger generations. And so we do need to innovate the way that we do ministry um, because we can't assume that they're going to accept, even even just accept truth the way that the older generations have. That's great to, to hear. So if I'm a 50-year-old, 60-year-old pastor, there's a couple of things that I'm, that I'm hearing there. One, mm-hmm. the way I've always done it might not be the way I should continue to do it in order to reach the, the next generation, mm-hmm. that I need to build trust with the, uh, the next generation in order to uh, have them hear and understand and accept what I'm, what I'm saying. They're not just going to accept it by face value or that the Bible is true. Uh, would all those things be accurate? Yeah, yeah, that's very accurate. And and I think also to encourage um, any older pastors who are listening to this, though, um, we, of course, do not need to sacrifice truth. And Correct. No water down. Right. Like, that's not what we're saying. Yeah. We're saying perhaps be open to innovating how you reach a yeah. generation with those biblical truths. And I think one in, in my study to, for this interview, one thing that I did see that we won't hit on is what are pastors concerned about? Mm-hmm. What are they thinking about? And top of the list was watered down gospel. Yeah. So I'm wondering if it's, there's this balance here of, I don't trust what you have to say. And well, I'm not going to water down the gospel. Is there that balance there? Absolutely. Oh, yes. And I think that that is the big, the big red button that is glaring (laughs) for so many leaders and rightfully so. And we need to work together to figure out how to dialogically engage with this generation and help them process their things. And we need to change our approach without doing that. Yes, it's a problem we need to solve. We need we got to figure it out together. The Church Online Guide is a comprehensive handbook for crafting your online worship experience. This 75-page guide will give you helpful tips and resources like ideas for your service flow, tips for your website, how to craft kids and student experiences, online giving, turning your live stream into an online campus of your church, and more. Pick up a copy of the book today and watch our free Church Online web series at 1230.media slash churchonline. 1230.media slash church online. The show notes for this episode are available now at makingsundayhappen.com. Well, hey guys, thank you so much for joining us on the show this week. Next week, we will continue our discussion with Savannah Kimberlin from Barna. I don't know about you, but I love these stats. I love knowing where we are as a church, the real stats so that we can know where to pour our energy into uh, as we move forward as a church. So we will wrap our conversation with Savannah up next week. Incredible uh, details, incredible practical stats that you can take uh, and know how to move forward uh, as a church where you are and how we can move forward as the church. Uh, That conversation will wrap up next week. All right. In two weeks, I'll welcome the authors of from Franchise to Local Dive, Jason Moore and Rosario Picardo will be in the house. We call him Roz. He'll be here next week along with Jason. 
We'll talk to the guys about how to multiply your church by discovering your contextual flavor. Are you intrigued? Maybe a little hungry? Well, all that will happen next week. We'll dive into that book starting uh, starting in two weeks, rather. In two weeks, Jason and Roz will be on the show. Well, thank you guys so much for hanging out this week. Go out there and create some incredible physical and digital worship experiences at your church this weekend. I'll catch you next week. Making Sunday Happen is a production of the Ministry of 1230 Media. For show notes, archive episodes, and more free resources for your church, visit makingsundayhappen.com. Yeah.